The quaint villages that decorate the countryside of rural Quebec are some of the most picturesque in Canada. But one of these communities is about to face a personal tragedy that will cut to its very heart and soul. October 1997. In the many towns and villages that decorate the landscape of rural Quebec, the tragedy of Saint-Jean-Vianney is a fading memory. Many of these picturesque communities hug the banks of the St. Lawrence River as it flows into the Charlevoix region, 90 kilometers east of Quebec City. The Charlevoix region offers a distinctive landscape of hills and valleys that makes it one of the most popular tourist attractions in the province. 64-year-old Véronique Guerron thinks it would be the perfect destination for an overnight getaway. A grieving widow for two years now, she tells her son Patrice she is ready to start living again. She had traveled quite a bit in her life, and she didn't only like going, but organizing trips as well. She said, I feel like going for an overnight trip to start with, then I'll organize something a bit bigger. She started talking to her friends and to people in the community to see if anyone was interested or not to go to a little trip to Charlevoix. Véronique lives in another quaint Quebec village, Saint Bernard de Beauce. The town of Saint Bernard is situated approximately 50 kilometers south of the city of Quebec. It's a small village of around 2,000 people, I should say. There are less and less of young people in Saint Bernard because there are not many possibilities of employment for young people in Saint Bernard. The population is getting older because of that. Fortunately, seniors in Saint Bernard are a dynamic group, very active in the life of the village. Most are members of the local Golden Age Club, known for its close ties to the community and to each other. As a member herself, it is this group that Véronique Garon first approaches with her plans for an overnight bus trip to the Charlevoix region on the Thanksgiving weekend. She is delighted with the response. She was always talking about her famous trip. This person is now registered, this gentleman will be there, this lady also. It's full, so she was in a hurry to reach the departure date of October 13, 1997. She had more people on the list than she had space in the bus. Golden Age Club president Yalonde Bertillon Labrec has a seat. So does former school secretary Claire Baudouin Chabot. They look forward to fulfilling their dreams to travel now that they have retired. Thanksgiving Monday, October 13th, 1997. At 11 a.m., 47 seniors gather in the church parking lot to board the bus that will take them to Charlevoix. All are between the ages of 60 and 70 and represent one quarter of the Golden Age Club membership. The bus is owned by the Mercier Charter Company, based near Quebec City. Mercier conducts many of the tours originating from the area. Everything seemed very good, and on top of that, my nephew used that company to do a trip to Toronto, and everything went okay. It was going to be a beautiful weekend, a nice trip full of fun. 29-year-old bus driver André de Ruisseau has a reputation for being conscientious behind the wheel and has driven many seniors' tours. He is also very familiar with the Charlevoix region. This particular bus, however, has been giving him some trouble. About a month before all of this happened, the bus driver had uh, taken his bus to the garage and had his brakes checked at the time, and he was told that he had the brake system was adequate, but there was uh, something faulty about the foot valve in the brake system, which was not distributing enough air to the entire brake system and should have it uh, looked after and repaired. Nothing was made of it at the time, and uh, that was it. As the bus leaves Saint Bernard, Veronique Garon looks forward to the overnight stay on Ile aux Coudes a popular holiday spot off the north banks of the St. Lawrence River. 
Vacationers catch a ferry from the dock in Saint-Joseph de la Rive, a tiny but picturesque tourist town of a few hundred people. It uh, is a small community in a very hilly area where the road sort of intertwines and uh, descends into that valley that sort of uh, links up with the, uh, with the ferry boat in that, in that small community and crosses over to L'Ile aux Coudres. To reach Saint-Joseph, most travelers take the main highway that follows the roller coaster contours of Charlevoix's distinctive geography. Even in the summertime, people consider these roads as being very dangerous, very treacherous. So um, any truck driver will tell you that these roads have to be uh, driven on with a great deal of care and uh, with uh, a great deal of focus on what you're doing behind the wheel. Otherwise, you can easily lose control of your vehicle. One of the steepest slopes is the secondary road that leads down to Saint-Joseph de la Rive and Ile aux Coudre. At the bottom of the hill is a turn so sharp that even the most experienced drivers must slow down considerably to take it safely. You would start going down at a quite steep inclination for about four kilometers. When you got to the last two kilometers, you were basically holding control of your, your vehicle, whether it be a car or a truck or a bus, using your brakes. The worst was, when you got to the bottom, the turn there had to be more than 90 degrees. And that was the biggest problem in the end. It was what we called the curve of death. The curve first gets that name in the summer of 1974, when a school bus loaded with seniors fails to make the turn at the bottom of the hill, killing 15 passengers and seriously injuring 24. That accident is far from the minds of Veronique Garon and her companions on the Mercier bus, as it follows the main highway through Charlevoix. Traveling behind it, 25-year-old Marc-André Beyroubet and his girlfriend Natasha Malte notice a familiar smell, even though their car windows are closed. The driver recognized the smell of burning brake oil and it's, it was a smell that it was distinctive. He, he recognized it right away. It is approximately 2.15 p.m. when the bus starts its descent towards Saint-Joseph. Like those around her, newly retired Claire Baudouin Chabot is so busy enjoying the trip, she fails to notice that bus driver André de Ruisseau has not geared down to slow his speed. This is a bus driver that knew it well he knew where he was, he knew what would happen. So he started to brake as he normally would going down that slope, heading into the last two kilometers of the slope. Now that's when his brakes failed. He tried to steer the bus onto this, the other lane, be able to take that final curve and just basically lost control. From her snack bar at the bottom, Georgette Tremblay sees the tour bus catapult erratically down the hill. She decides that at that speed, it can't possibly be carrying passengers. The bus crashed through the gate. It literally flew over this ravine and landed on its side and slid for quite a few yards along this, this ravine. October 13th, 1997. On a quiet Thanksgiving Monday in Saint-Joseph de la Rive, Quebec parish priest Father Jean Moisin receives a telephone call. A tour bus has crashed in the ravine at the bottom of the hill, and there are souls on board that need absolution immediately. The people that were the first on site called me right away, and then I left. I jumped into my car and went to the site of the accident. Local resident Louis Lacroix is one of the first on the scene and can hear the sound of moaning from inside the overturned bus. He jumped on the bus and broke some of the windows that were there and, and started yelling to people you know, to hold on that the, uh, the rescue team was on its way. He was stepping on the seats basically wherever he could without stepping on the bodies. There are bodies everywhere and 
Uh, he took the pulse of a number of them, and they had already uh, they had already died. Rescue teams cut away portions of the front of the bus to gain access to the people inside. Bus driver Andre Derouisso is unconscious but alive. Unfortunately, he will die at the scene from suffocation due to a crushed rib cage and massive internal bleeding. Well, the local priest arrived on the location immediately not long after and uh, just yelled out to everyone that was there, saying, giving them absolution, knowing full well that the vast majority of the people in that bus were either dead or were about to die. I gave them absolution for their sins to be forgiven, so they could go directly to heaven. There was not one word, an absolute silence, absolute. The silence of death. By the time members of the media arrive, rescue teams have removed most of the bodies, and ambulances are taking survivors to hospital. I remember driving down that hill, and I started braking, realizing how steep it was. It was hard, hard enough for, for a vehicle, for a car, uh, which was in good condition to stop down, down uh, heading down this road. So I could imagine what it was like for that bus driver as he, as he went down the road and basically lost control of his vehicle. When I arrived there and got out of my vehicle and started, started walking down where uh, the accident had occurred. And if death has a smell, that was it. And uh, as you walked closer, and uh, uh, you noticed a line of bodies that were just covered, they were all covered in blankets lined up uh, below near near the, the crash site. It was a very eerie feeling, a very eerie sense, that contrast with the beauty of the location of the site and the quiet demeanor of, the, uh, of nature itself. With the arrival of more media, news of the accident starts to reach family members. Radio show host Patrice Moore is at home on this holiday Monday helping his daughter decorate the house for Halloween. The telephone rang. It was my brother. My brother says, turn on your TV. What's going on? Apparently, there is a big crash in the area of Les Ebouements, one that includes a bus. It might be the bus from the Mercier company, the bus where our mother was. Then he says, he adds, there might be lots and lots of casualties. Patrice immediately calls several police contacts, but gets no confirmation that the bus is from the Mercier company. The police, however, are interested to learn that his mother, Véronique Garon, organized the trip. When they ask for a passenger list, Patrice Moore gets his confirmation. They were saying nothing, but between the lines, I knew that was it. They asked me for a list of people on the bus knowing it was my mother who organized the trip and that there ought to be a copy at home. I went with my brother to Saint Bernard. We had a house key. There's a little note on the table. It's bizarre because my mother had written, be happy. That's what she wrote on the note. Then we started to search for a list of people on the bus. It was not long before we found one under a pile of papers on the counter in the kitchen. Not long after Patrice Moore takes the list to the police, officials confirm that the passengers on the bus are from Saint Bernard. Shortly after the news hits, anxious relatives gather at the local town hall and at the church trying to get news of their loved ones. Patrice Moore and his family head for Charlevoix, figuring that if their mother is alive, she will appreciate having them by her side. There were many reports on the radio. In Quebec City, they said that 10 killed out of 40. Once we got to St. Anne de Beaupré, they were saying 20. At the hospital, Patrice learns that only a handful of passengers have survived. 44 have died in the worst road accident in Quebec's history including his mother, Véronique Garon. The entire village of Saint-Bernard is in shock. 
in a town of only 2,000, the tragedy touches everyone. Golden Age Club president Yolande Bertillaume Labrec, her husband, and eight of his cousins are all killed in the crash. So is Claire Baudouin Chabot, whose retirement was going to fulfill a lifelong dream to travel. The trip to Charlevoix is her first and last. The Golden Age Club loses six of its nine board members. Over 20 homes in Saint Bernard suddenly stand empty, three of them side by side. It's enormous, enormous on a town where everyone knows each other. Everyone knows the victims, everyone knows their families. People there had lost their parents, and the younger children had lost their grandparents, all four grandparents. These were people who had, who were in their 60s, uh, who had suddenly passed away, and it, it dug a big hole in the life of that community. Part of their past disappeared on a particular day, on that Thanksgiving day in, in 1997. The next day, October 14th, grieving families gather to identify their loved ones. The impact of the crash leaves some of the victims unrecognizable and identification must be made through clothing and dental records. Some were easier than others. In my mother's case, it went well. We could identify her by her face. But in other cases, it was by the hand or from the jewelry. And there were some who were mistaken. They were obliged to come back that night because they had identified the wrong person. The media is everywhere and private sorrow becomes a very public news story as families make funeral arrangements on a massive scale. We all live through deaths in the family. Usually it's not very complicated. We have a lot of grief. We live it independently. We live it as a family. It doesn't go public. But then we couldn't. We couldn't handle it like that, because there were 43 people from the same area that died. On November 12th, one of the five injured passengers dies in hospital, leaving a grieving village to mourn another lost friend, relative and neighbor. In June of 1998, a coroner's inquest releases its verdict that the accident was caused by faulty brakes and could have been prevented. Had that bus been, uh, been repaired or perhaps in a better inspection of the buses, uh, went to death. The coroner, he said that it was the brakes, but it wasn't only the brakes, it was also the curve. He didn't go into that, unfortunately, and I was disappointed, very, very disappointed. While the inquiry makes no recommendations on the hill itself, it does bring changes to highway inspection policy and the enforcement of existing regulations. And what we have now as a result of this particular accident is you have uh, highway inspectors traveling the highways now, stopping vehicles that are suspicious or that may not have proper equipment. The Minister of Transportation also placed an obligatory stop at the top of the hill for all vehicles like buses or trucks. So these vehicles are obligated to stop in an area, check their brakes before descending. Despite strong opposition from environmental groups, the government reconstructs the hill leading down to Saint-Joseph-de-la-Rive. So they began the reshaping of the hill and installing a stopping lane so that if ever a vehicle comes down the hill and can't stop, he will find himself in an area that is full of fine gravel where he will sink without finding himself in the St. Lawrence River or upside down with the dead. In Saint Bernard, a memorial stands at the entrance to the cemetery bearing the names of those taken so quickly that terrible Thanksgiving day. Yet, while the village will never be the same, many feel that something positive has happened here, despite the pain. Soon after the accident, surviving members vow to rebuild the Golden Age Club, 
Today, the club has more members than ever before and is once again the heart and soul of the community. I think what it did is, is brought everybody closer together immediately afterwards and the, the, the hard, long work of rebuilding took place there. And uh, for, for that community to pull through this, uh, it took certainly a long time for them to come together and to, to understand what took place and to, uh, and to live with, with uh, that tragic event. Inside the cemetery, 43 gravestones offer a sad reminder of this community's darkest day. For others, that memory will forever remain a part of who they are. I think what uh, will always become, be a part of my mind is when I walked down that, that, that slope, that hill, and saw the bodies lined up in the escarpment, um, covered in, in the blankets, and, and just looking around and seeing how, how this was such in deep contrast with the beauty of the region. It is a vision that will always be, uh, be, a, be a part of me for, for as long as I, as I live. Every time that I pass on that curve, I think about the accident. Every time. We have a memory to remember this. We have the heart's memory. And the heart's memory remains for a long time.